my name is Patrick O'Brien and I'm the General Counsel of the University. Uh, it is my honour and special privilege to welcome you on behalf of the Vice-Chancellor and the University to the Professorial Inaugural Lecture of Professor Clinton A. Balboa. I wish you to express a warm welcome to all of you, his loved ones, his special guests and his colleagues. This is a proud, joyful and landmark moment for all of you, for Professor I. Balboa and of course for all of us here at UJ. Uh, I wish to acknowledge uh, His Excellency the Ambassador Kabiru Bala, the Nigeria's High Commissioner to South Africa, His Excellency the Consul General of Nigeria to South Africa, Godwin Adama, Professor Daniel Mashawa, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Bolt Environment of UJ, Dr. Chulitsi Rachitanga, the Deputy Chairperson of the Gauteng Growth and Development Agency, the GCDA, who is also the Chairperson of the Board of Directors of the Innovation App Management Company, which is a subsidiary company of the GD, uh, GCDA uh, and a member of its Group Social and Ethics Board Committee members of Senate and, uh, um, and academics, and also to the special guests of Professor Aibavoa. I welcome his mother, Mrs. Uh, Veronica Aibavoa. I didn't have the privilege of meeting her. Can she perhaps just put up her hand if you can see her? Thank you. Welcome. Um, his sisters, Miss Blessing and Comfort uh, Aibavoa. His brother, Dr. Solomon Abavoa. <laughs> His lifetime mentor, Mr. Orakunle Okalola. <laughs> and, and whilst they cannot attend the event tonight, Professor Abavoa senior brother, Mr. Oja Abavoa, also deserves acknowledgement, and uh, Professor Charles Mabowa from the faculty. The inauguration of a professor is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office and deliver their, their inaugural addresses. The ceremony has its roots in the medieval university and serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it is an expression of welcome and an entry for new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. Secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in their discipline and showcase their research. Thirdly, it stands out as a moment of pride and celebration for the incumbent, his or her family, fellow scholars, the university and society. It is a celebration of the achievement of a major, major milestone, as well as contributions made to the discipline and the ultimate, ultimate impact on our society. This evening we are gathered to bear witness to the entry of Professor Aibaldoa into the, into the illustrious community of scholars at the university. We will listen to his inaugural lecture as one further step in the journey of being a professor. This is a journey that does not end once this lecture has been given. It is a self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor with a promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contribute to the rich intellectual body of work in his discipline. Professor Ekpabubabawa, we look forward to your address, and I invite the Executive Dean, Professor Daniel Moshao, to introduce you uh, to the audience. Reale bocha, sia bonga, bae thank you. to read to you the biography of Professor Clinton or his Aifbaboa, which you have in your program. Clinton or his Aifbaboa was born in Edo State, Nigeria. He obtained a higher national diploma degree in quantity surveying from the Federal Polytechnic Aichu Edo State, Nigeria in 1988. 
a Master's of Technology in Construction Management in 2010, and a PhD in Engineering Management in 2014 from the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. He has also completed a certificate of good governance in Africa from the Thabo Mbeki Africa Leadership Institute at the University of South Africa. Prior to the compulsory one-year National Service Corporation Nigeria, he assisted in a high school in the teaching of chemistry and mathematics for one year. After working in the construction industry for eight years in various capacities as a project quantity surveyor, cost estimator, and a project management capacity, he joined the Department of Construction Management and Quantity Surveying at the University of Johannesburg in July 2007 as a master's student and as a part-time lecturer. Professor Ifa Boas involvement in developing novel and innovative solutions to key research problems uh, has developed over time. Professor Clinton F. Baboa currently serves as a Vice Dean for Postgraduate Studies, Research and Innovation in the Faculty of Engineering and the Build Environment at the University of Johannesburg. One prominent concern of researchers, particularly those dealing with Sustainable urban development and transformation is effective disseminating what has been discovered to the wider urban community for adoption in development projects to change and improve human lives at all levels. During the past five years, since his doctoral graduation, Professor Ike Bavboa has co-authored and authored more than 500 accredited journals, articles, conference papers, book chapters. He is also the author of five research books that were published by Springer Nature and CRC Press. In addition, he is also a co-author of the edited book on the subject of the fourth industrial revolution and the construction industry that was published by Springer Nature in 2019. Professor Ai Faboa is currently a visiting professor in the School of Civil Engineering of the Shandong University, China, and in the Department of Civil Engineering of the University of Nigeria, Nsuka. He is also a Y2 National Research Foundation rated researcher and a recipient of several research grants from the National Research Foundation, the Department of Higher Education, and the British Council. Professor Ai Baboa collaborates with research experts in the construction industry, both locally and internationally, to create new knowledge and provide practical solutions in the built environment. Prof Clinton is self-motivated, driven by excellence and his passion for research in the built environment and its improvement. Prof. Clinton has a wide range of work experience from consulting firms and construction companies through universities to governments. He is currently the chief editor of the Journal of Construction Project Management and Innovation and the newly established Journal of Sustainable Human Settlement Development. He has received national and international recognition in his field of research. In 2015, Prof. A. Baboa was a recipient of the University of Johannesburg Vice Chancellor Distinguished Award for the Most Promising Researcher of the Year, the best researcher in 2014 and 2015. The Department of Construction Management and Quantity Surveying Best Master's Research Student Department of Construction Management and Quantity Survey in 2010, and the best graduating student, Department of Quantity Surveying of the Federal Polytech, Achu, Nigeria, 1999. Please welcome, please celebrate this great man and his achievement. Thank you.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I really don't know where to start from, but I really want to say thank you very much for coming out this evening to be part of this inaugural lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Patrick O'Brien, Acting Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much also, uh, Executive Dean and uh, Dr. Rashitanga. Thank you. And most importantly, thank you very much, His Excellency, uh, the Consul General of Nigeria to South Africa, His Excellency, Mr. Patrick Adama. Thank you so much. And all colleagues around, I don't know where to start from to start mentioning names, but I want to say all protocols out. However, I really want to extend the warm appreciation to my spouse, Mrs. Sita Aigbavua. She's sitting somewhere. Thank you very much for the support. Most of the time, I'm never at home. <laughs> and she, she plays the role of the, of the CEO. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, colleagues, this evening, I really want to share with us something that is very dear to my heart that I have been thinking about that is actually becoming an obsession. I know the title in front of you is kind of interesting trying to look at looking beyond the classics of methodological occupancy. I know some of us would have tried to Google it to find out where is this methodological occupancy. You're not going to find it. No way. But if you have Googled something like methodological individualism, which is basically the concept that I have been working on to look at the different school of thoughts when it comes to how housing should be created, moving away from what we currently see in terms of the neo-colonialism that basically have eroded every policy and decision making that we have in the entire continent of Africa. Uh, my speech tonight is actually going to focus on the urban poor. I'm very, they're very dear to me, looking at people that live in a city that are not able to assess opportunities that you and I are able to actually assess. I'm going to go through this particular content very briefly. Uh, in terms of the beginning, I'm not really going to give you the whole background of my life, but I'm going to talk about in the beginning where I started from, how I got into what I'm talking about this evening, and most importantly, I have to, we have to look at something that is very important, the new reality. The new reality, which is basically, is here to stay, it is here with us, and we need to basically start thinking in terms of how to ensure that. Uh, we embrace this particular new reality. From there, I'm going to talk about the urban poor extensively to, to say who are the urban poor. Then I'll speak a little bit on housing policy. And uh, housing policies are really there to me also. Then uh, I will talk about the aspects of the urban poor in terms of the right to adequate housing. And uh, from the right to adequate housing, I will move a little bit into the provision of an enabling environment. And uh, I will talk about some take home message and the future in terms of where do I want to be five years from now, 10 years from now. Having graduated in 2014, uh, I really aspire to ensure that my contribution to knowledge is something that lives beyond me. In the very beginning, I remember when I was growing up in a very small village in Edo State, I have another brother that was grooming me, that groomed me to become a medical doctor. Everything about my life was medicine. And I really wanted to become a gynecologist. So I, 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 I went out going for it. Somehow, as I was growing up, my other brother was working in a construction company. And uh, he made a mistake by coming home with a friend that was a quantity surveyor. And this guy was so handsome, and he told me beautiful things about quantity surveying. And when he left, I made up my mind that I was going to be a quantity surveyor. <laughs> and my, my other brother have never liked that guy. It's like he aborted his dream. <laughs> so in the beginning, when I wrote my matric equivalent in South Africa, uh, everybody wanted me to go for medicine in terms of when I was applying for universities. I could not with my mom to give me money to enroll for quantity survey in a polytechnic. So my mom is actually somebody that is very dear to me, and she supported me. N nobody, was, nobody was that well in the family that I have actually applied for quantity surveying in the polytechnic. So in 1990, 1994, after my matric, 1995, I went to study quantity surveying. 
in the polytechnic, uh, in the federal polytechnic of uh, in Nauchi, in those states. Uh, after that, I had an opportunity of coming back again to medicine. My cousin Solomon, Solomon was a lecturer in pharmacy. They tried and did everything to bring me back. They brought me back to the campus. After three months, I decided to run away. And I thank God I ran away. <laughs> and uh, after quantities of vain, I practiced a little bit in Lagos. After practicing for seven years, I decided to start a quantities of vain firm. I was running the quantities of vain firm myself. And uh, after a while, I felt that the work I was doing was very redundant. And I needed something that was actually an obsession in my mind, which was academics. So I made up my mind one day to go and study uh, somewhere. And uh, the destination was South Africa, and I did my master's in construction management. But before construction management in UJ, the very first institution I was supposed to go was UP or VIT. I had applied, I got my proposal accepted, and I came in, and I was not successful with funding. And UJ was just two years old. And I remember I met uh, Professor Wellington Twala, who is my lifetime mentor, and uh, they accepted me. That was how I did co construction management in 2008. Then I graduated in 2010. So I was thinking, in record time, not really. I had complications, prof. And uh, after that, <laughs> during the process of doing my master's, I started by basically by writing a proposal in construction cost modeling as a quantity surveyor. After I defended the proposal, something happened. My mentor, Professor Twala, came one afternoon and gave me a handbook on housing issues and agenda in South Africa. He just told me, you just glance through it. After going through this particular handbook, I, I came across the subsidized low-income housing, popularly known as RODP. Then I saw an aspect of post-occupancy evaluation. I just fell in love with the word post-occupation. Then when I tried to dig deep a little bit, I realized that this is basically where my passion lies. And I have to abort my proposal in construction cost modeling. And that's how I ended up doing housing. So I, I did my master's. My topic was entitled Post-Occupancy Evaluation in Subsidized Low-Income Housing. And thereafter, I pursued a PhD in engineering management, DFIL engineering management. Uh, in that particular study, I focused on just looking at the beneficiaries, beneficiary-centered satisfaction model, which was actually shaped. Initially, I was looking at the entire housing sub satisfaction. And uh, I remember CIDB. Thank you so much. I see somebody from CIDB tonight, Dr. Ntebo. CIDB had the first doctoral uh, workshop section, and we went to Cape Town to make a presentation. And uh, after my presentation, I had a chat with uh, Professor David Root somewhere. And David Root was like, why do you want to solve the whole world's problem? You're not going to win a Nobel laureate. Why don't you just focus on something very interesting, beneficiary satisfaction? I struggled. At the end of the day, I discussed with my mentor, and he agreed. And that's basically the journey I have been. And in the very beginning, I've had very good, excellent mentors. I came across this book some years ago, The Tribe of Mentors. Well, after reading it, I saw how most of these very successful athletes, musicians, and all that were really, really amazing, not because they were talented, because they had mentors. And over time, all these mentors, they have basically formed part of, they have formed my social history. Uh, I don't want to, it's not, it's, it's not according to order of preference or order of hierarchy. It's just how the pictures yeah, just come into my mind. This was the very first mentor I have as a quantity surveyor. I, I won't forget what he, what, what he taught me. Basically, he taught me perseverance. He taught me how to be patient. But overall, I want to say that the excellence, the, the marvelous mentors have really been instrumental to what I am currently doing today. I really want to say thank you very much for your contributions. Also, in the beginning, it's a very large family I have. I'm from a family of eight. I'm number six. Okay, so I have five sisters, four in front of me, who taught me how to iron clothing. Okay, and they are very good with that. And uh, I had a lot of excellent uh, friends, my pastor. And uh, I have a friend here who I call the family. He actually exposed me into the aspect of English. And uh, he's a lawyer. And also, we, we worked together when I was growing up, and also my family. So in case you are not here, know very well that you are special to me. I have just 40 minutes, so I have to quickly say less of pictures. So thank you so much, guys, and also to my family. Thank you. Looking at what I'm talking about tonight, in terms of the new urban reality, and uh, 
the subsidized low-income housing, looking at sustainable development, looking at where we are as a country in South Africa, there's a dimension of the South African Vision 2030, which is basically called the NDP. And if you look at the NDP very well, which is very well documented, each aspect of this particular NDP from the very outcome number 1 to 14 talks about things that need to be actualized, things that need to be done in the country. And uh, this particular four outcomes speaks to the triple challenges that we have in the country, the triple challenges of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. And uh, within this particular NDP is situated the research that I have really pursued in number eight that talks about sustainable human settlement and imp uh, improved quality of household life. Because there is no way we want to basically be a very inclusive society with equity and all that without talking about having a human settlement that will respond to the needs of everybody. So I really want to say that within the NDP lies my research. Uh, it's one of the things that we need to really consider in terms of how, where I'm going to and how I need to really pursue the future. And that's the reason why I'm showing it to us that everything that my research have tried to really capture over time is within this particular uh, resolution or trying to resolve issues of the triple challenges of poverty, either in capacity development or unemployment, which we have done in a great deal, and also the aspect of the inequality. And with the, with, the, with the NDP comes this particular new reality. The new reality is we have an urban problem. Everybody is moving to the city. Nobody wants to stay in the village. More opportunities in the city. And uh, with the new urban problems lies the future of the world. So you get, you, we, we see that the future of the world's population is, an, is, is, is the urban area. And in some of the developed countries, it's difficult for you to actually distinguish between a rural area or an urban area. However, this particular phenomenon gives us a new face, the new face of the developing world cities, which is a reality that we face, and we need to look at how to deal with it. And this particular new reality is what we basically call slums. Uh, we know it's a derogatory word. Most people call it informal settlement, all kind of names. You can find it in Kenya, you can find it in Brazil, you can find it all across the continent of Africa. It's a new reality that we need to deal with. It's not something that we talk about eradicating. Eradication is not going to solve it because the more you want to eradicate, automatically they are still going to basically spring up every now and then again. It's a reality. I call it the new urban reality. And with this new urban reality comes this particular context of the growing urban organization trends that we have in the world. Yes, there is that particular aspect of the decrease. You see some statistics that will tell you there's a decrease in the number of people that stays in the slum. However, if you really drill into what is happening in the, in the, in the global phenomenon, you realize that there's an absolute increase in the numbers of people coming to the city. There's absolute increase in the number of people that are living in slum. So automatically, from what we see from the United Nations uh, report, says that in, by the year 2030, we are basically sure that we can have close to like 3 billion people living in the cities. However, the question is, how many of those people are actually going to be within the space that we call the urban poor? So that's why this evening, I really want to talk a little bit on the urban poor, and we try to look at how to go about the solution. So with the urban poor phenomenon comes the global reality. The global reality is that in today's world, slum and its existence is a reality. It's a reality, and we have to deal with it. There's massive urbanization. There's slumification every now and then. Even some areas that you actually call urban areas, there is the issue basically where you have this uh, in Bakiaism, where somebody have a plot, and he basically start building little, little rooms inside. Automatically, that is a tendency of slumification. And with what we see uh, from the research that has been done over time, I'm sure some of the pictures are basically familiar with uh, familiar to us, that hundreds of millions of people are living in very poor urban environments without access to basic living requirements. It's a reality. We see it. But the question is, how do we resolve this particular issue? That's what I want to really try to unpack tonight. Still part of the global statistics that 1 billion people currently live in slum. That's basically the, the statistics that we get. That's what we are told. And that's what basically the United Nations is reporting. But the question is, which we must ask ourselves as, acad as academians, as people working in the industry, is how is this particular, how are this research conducted? What is the methodology? And also, that it's reported that more than 70% of the urban population, they are living in Africa. More than 70% of urban population in Africa lives in slum. However, it is projected that if urban poverty is going to basically increase with the pace of urbanization, 
We are going to have more than 1 billion people that are living in Islam. It's going to double to 2 billion people that, are living, that will be living in Islam by 2030. And we're talking about 2030 here. It's just some very few years away from here. So if you look at this particular statistic, say that one in four people in the world, in the urban population, live in slum. That tells you that even the two billion we're looking at, with the population exclusion that is coming, we actually we are going to have more than two billion that will be living in slum. But the question is, what is Islam? How do we define Islam? That's where we're going to talk about the right to housing later, which we can use to basically capture that. And with the understanding of the Islam and how the, the statistics we talked about, one thing that we must really look at is the aspect of the, mig the migration cobweb. Because with the migration cobweb comes this particular phenomenon. Because there is a global movement of people. Yeah, at the moment, Africans cease to be moving to Europe, moving to America. And at the end of the day, there were, once upon a time, even the Europeans were moving to other areas. There was a time when there was great migration between the, from, the, from Italy to the US and all that. At the moment, what we're seeing is that Africans seems to be immigrating. Some of these pictures are familiar to us. And with the, with the issue of migration comes slums. Because some of the people cannot assess decent housing. They basically have to uh, put, put up something that will enable them to assess opportunities in the city. And uh, with the migration uh, cobweb comes a whole lot of issues of poverty, crimes, and a whole lot of things that we see in our society today. So when we try to look at what we have in Africa, looking at Johannesburg, looking at cities like Accra, looking at Lagos, somebody can say, yes, there's high level of crime in Johannesburg. But the issue is there's high level of urbanization in Johannesburg. More people are coming into the city every day, and they don't have anything to do, forms part of this particular migration cobweb. I just illustrated. So in the context also of the growing urbanization, that 87% of cities worldwide are unaffordable. This is the reality. They are very much unaffordable. First of all, look, just look at the increasing housing demand. If you look at the increasing housing demand, that about 55% of the total world population live in urban areas. Okay? And 3 billion we need access to housing by 2030. The one that is basically kind of really intriguing is the adequate housing and slum upgrading issue. That look at the numbers that we need. When I see these particular numbers, there's the, also the issues of the unfoxed, I mean, on the un, unlawful fox evictions. In terms of one billion people are actually slum dwellers, then I have to now look at the issue of affordability. The affordability issue here, you know, I'm really particular interest. I'm really interested in the South African dimension, which. If you look at it, the question will be, is it correct? Is it not correct? That is why we need to do more research to say, if the statistics we are getting from the United Nations say that only, only 200,000 people are homeless in South Africa, it becomes questionable. Because you and I know that the statistics will be more than this. But the question is, what do we regard as the homeless? How do you define homelessness? These are issues that basically we can do more research. And 100 million homeless people we find worldwide. It's not a phenomenon. It's not an African phenomenon. If you go to the street of Detroit, if you go to lose, uh, if you go to the U.S., everywhere you find it, it is there. So it's not an African phenomenon. About 400 million affordable houses are needed by 2025. That tells you that there is a very big opportunity right before us to actually tap into as a continent. So. See on some of the urbanization facts, I just want to bring out something here to say that, in contrast uh, to everything I've been saying, that Africa remains the most <laughs> rural area with 43% 40, of its population living in urban areas, compared to some other areas where you have close to like 81% of the, of, the, of the population living in, 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 in very good uh, conditions and all that. Uh, research have found that three cities, India, or three countries, India, China, and Nigeria, were expected to basically contribute about 35% of the growing world population. Okay? And uh, the question would be, if they are going to contribute to 35% of the growing world population by 2050, do we have the space, do we have the adequate housing to actually take care of them? That is why we that are working in the construction space, those of us in humanities, and all domains, we need to basically work together to see how to house these people. If you pick a country like China, China is basically trying to do what they can do to really accommodate their people. But the question is, how is it happening in India, much more with Nigeria? So India is projected to add about 460 million urban dwellers, China 255 million, and Nigeria is projected to add by 2050 189 million. 
So if you look at where Nigeria currently is at the moment, it's projected that Nigeria is between 180 and 200 million. So by 2025, by 2020, or by 2050, 189 is added. That tells you that it can be close to the size of, of, an, of America. So the question is, do we have the adequate housing space to really cater for these people? That's why I'm talking about the urban poor tonight. Why do I focus on the urban poor? There's this book I read when I came to South Africa, The Mystery of Capitalism by Hernando Sutu, very interesting book. He was saying that what we are seeing today is that the poor are doing much more for themselves compared to the aids that they are being given. They are saving by themselves, they build homes themselves, they cater for themselves. We might call those homes shacks, but they basically build homes themselves. So if you look at the people that are really being proactive to take uh, responsibility for their own existence, that tells you that we need to really try to place a focus on them. We need to put a satellite on them to see how we can actually contribute to what they are doing. And uh, why I'm focusing on the poor is that over the past 25 years, the urban growth rate in the developing countries, in the developing world, was three times higher than the rural growth rate. And if you look at the second statistic, it says that over the next 25 years, over the next 25 years, the urban growth rate will be about 25 uh, times higher than the current growth rate that we have. That tells you that there's going to be problem that is coming if we don't really do something to address the situation. And uh, by 2025, to third of the poor in uh, the countries of Latin America and the, Carib and the Caribbean are uh, basically are really going to, most of them are going to live in the city. And the question is, do they have the resources? And African is fast urbanizing at an unprecedented rate, as we all know. So that's why I'm really putting my satellite on the urban port to see what we can do for them. And also, my focus on the other urban poor is because they merit the basic right to everything that is happening within the city. They merit the basic right of urban citizens. They are not subservient to anybody that lives in the city. And also, as I said, they save wheat and they borrow amongst themselves. They build their own homes. They create their own networks. And these are the people that we need to work with. It's a reality. And the, 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 the ability, the opportunity for us to tap into the particular informal economy can actually have a very good uh, multiplier effect in terms of what we have today. And for the first time, as, we have, as I've been saying, that 68% of the world is projected to live in cities, and the global population will grow to about 3.3 billion people. What is an urban area? That's another thing we need to ask ourselves. How do you define an urban area? And an urban area is categorized by higher population density, or the one that is kind of very interesting is the aspect of how the, an urban area is an area that is created and much more further developed by the process of urbanization. We can say, okay, that's an urban area. However, if we have people living there, then I can say, okay, who is the poor? Who are the poor? That a poor household in this kind of, in, the, in, the, in, in, my, in my present talk tonight, is a household that lacks these five basic amenities. They lack improved water. They, they lack access to improved sanitation. Uh, the executive dean was having a speech once, and he said that one of the greatest revolutions that nobody talks about is this revolution of sanitation. Just for us to know how to control, basically, the waste that comes, that we generate, that have actually saved humanity, and have actually enabled us to, to grow to where we are today. Because just imagine, just basic cholera how it's really wiped out a whole lot of people. At the moment, that's not the problem. So the, the, the poor, they, they don't have access to secure tenure. They, they, they lack durable housing and much more sufficient living area. And when I'm talking about sufficient living area here, we're looking at, by United Nations definition, there's a certain number of people that should live in a room, not a, in a house where you have 10 people living in a room. That is not a sufficient living area. Okay? So that's one of the things we have to look at. Also, the urban poor, they live in marginalized areas of the city, and they have limited access to opportunities. So looking at just the word poor, I try to look at it that, first of all, the poor lacks participation in the city, they lack opportunity, also they lack ownership, and much more, they lack resources. So this is basically the people that are deprived of what I'm talking about this evening. And what then can we say is considered the urban poor, that these are families. So I try to bring both of them together to say, okay, if we understand the word urban, we understand the word poor, that the urban poor basically are families or they're individuals who are living in poor conditions, who are desperate for opportunities in the city. And they live in the neglected part of the city. And these are families who reside in urban areas whose income fall below the poverty threshold. 
Then you, that you can check for yourself. What is the property threshold in various cities that we have? Some particular areas, they live below $1 per day. So the question is, how is that sustainable in this kind of world that we are living in? And with that particular understanding, we can look at the cumulative impact of urban poverty. Because if we don't do anything to address this situation, we are going to have these issues all along. And one of my most fascinating aspects is the sense of insecurity, where they are isolated, and there's that particular disempowerment, which is really, to me, like hegemony. And much more, you look at the unhygienic living condition and all that. We know the cost of health care in the, in the urban area, how they're able to assess it. And with this particular cumulative impact, it can actually spell disaster for those of us living in the urban areas, much more those in the rural areas. I'm going to speak a little bit about housing policy issues because this brings me into the aspect of the methodological uh, individualism and, and occupancy. That one of the things that we should look at that in order for us to adequately house the urban poor, for us to ensure that poverty is eradicated within the urban space, we need to redefine our national policies. We need to redefine our national agenda and the financing mechanism that we currently have in place. What we currently have in place is working, but it's not sufficient to actually respond to the needs of the urban poor. And with that, scholars need to really stand out to advocate for the needs of the urban dwellers. It's not something that we should consider in the dark. We should basically be vocal about it and really defend the rights of the urban poor. Because if you look at some families that are doing very well today, some contributing to society, they, there is that particular effect. Even the construction industry, some of the lab, most of the laborers, they come from this particular group. So if we don't cater for them, we're going to have a whole lot of issues in the future. So with the issue of the, urban, uh, the, the housing policy to support the, the urban poor, that globally housing policies have been used generally to, is more or less as an attempt to try and address the housing problems that we have around us. But the question is, the policies that we have, are they able to actually address these particular issues? That's where I'm actually going to. So an understanding of the concept of housing practice and the nature of housing and the policies and theories will actually enable us to understand how to solve the problem that we have uh, within us today. And uh, looking into part of the theories, in terms of the literatures that have been written on housing development since the 1960s, you realize that many housing scholars actually trying to view the issue of housing supply and delivery for various kind of theoretical positions and framework. And one of them is the neoclassical, the neoclassicalism or the institutionalism, or the other aspect which I like so much, the neo-Marxism. Okay, Marxism is something you need to consider because most people don't like hearing the word Marxism. Basically, they see it as dictatorship. Okay? But you have to look at it that between democracy and new Marxism, or between democracy and Marxism, and uh, what I'm talking about this evening, the neoclassicalism, the issue is, are these particular policies, these particular theories able to address the issue of housing? However, the question is, this concept I'm talking about, this concept of housing, these particular theories, are they actually able to precisely address the issue of housing that we are facing in the urban areas? I would say no. Because if they were really complete, if it, it, it is, if it was holistic, we realize that we're not going to be having the problem that we have at the moment. So looking a little bit into the neoclassical perspective, the neoclassical perspective on housing draws its theoretical guidance from neoclassical economists or thinkers. And uh, these particular thinkers basically believe that uh, we, we, we need to look at a particular homogeneous group to look at how they are thinking, understand their qualities, understand how they behave, and with that particular understanding, we can actually come up with a solution. So the neoclassical the neo -classic, uh, classic thinkers, they view society as a collection of individuals whose nature is assumed to be given, which is true, okay? And the, re the realization of this particular individual preference, they say that it shapes the form of economy, the behavior, even the nature of the society that we have, much more how we should create our housing. That's why you see like the RODP housing scheme is like a one size fits all. We assume that, you know, a, a first square, uh, if a 40 square room or a house should be enough for everybody without considering the aspect of the housing life cycle. We discuss this particular aspect. We believe that once we understand these particular individuals, that we should look at society from the perspective of the individuals, which is this good, because society is made up of individuals. Individuals are the ones that form the society. You cannot separate one from the other. However, that is not sufficient, in my, in my view, to actually solve the problem that we have in our hands today. So the neoclassical perspective is considered the orthodox approach to cities 
and the housing uh, issues or solutions because of the supposition in the methodological individualism. And the you neoclassical know, thinkers makes four suppositions. This particular, just let's be, pay a little bit of attention, that the first, that first of all, that the creation of goods and services reveals the preference of consumers, demand and supply. Then it is assumed that all households and organizations have a perfect information before they make a decision, which is very subjective. We're going to see that later. And thirdly, the supposition is that from this particular basic, from this particular understanding of the information they have, households are able to get uh, that kind of attrition to be able to make a, a decision to maximize anything that they want to go into. And in, the, in this case, housing. And lastly, the other supposition of the neoclassical perspective or the methodological individualism is the fact that the creation of goods and services Okay, is assumed to be flexible in that the factors of production can easily be interchanged. Yes, I agree, we, we believe that can, can, can happen, but the question is, would this suffice to actually solve our problem? However, colleagues, it should be borne in mind that the, the theoretical root of this particular supposition, as I said, is on this particular understanding of individualism. So, the methodological position of uh, individualism explains that all economic phenomena in terms of the characteristics uh, and the behavior of individuals is what we should use to understand how we should create any kind of services for them. Because it is believed that everything can ultimately be reduced to the individuals, what individuals do. Okay. And the issue of urban housing is this. That if we want to understand it from the occupant's point of view, based on what I have been saying, from what I have been working on as a housing researcher, I have to come up with the aspect of the methodological occupancy. That if we, everything I've been talking about, if we understand this from that particular perspective of what the individuals do, what the housing occupants do, what housing occupants need, then we can say, okay, can we talk about methodological occupancy? And in my definition, methodological occupancy is a position where housing delivery is reduced to the needs of housing beneficiaries and specifically at what they need in terms of the evolution. And uh, this particularly is out of the neoclassical view, which in my opinion is not enough to actually house the urban poor. That's why I'm trying to make a case for them tonight. And, uh, but when it comes to housing generally, I want to say that uh, no theory is at the moment sufficient to actually be able to address what we have. And that's why I'm, I'm thinking that we should basically move away. We should move beyond this particular supposition to actually look within a different framework that is more humane in our approach in terms of how we deliver uh, housing, deliver any kind of services for the, for the urban poor. One of the things I want to talk about as I round up is the fact that the, the criticism against this particular methodological individualism or occupancy. Because it is believed that this particular model fails to consider the structuring of household housing decisions. It fails to consider that. Because you can't just focus on the individuals alone. You have to move beyond that. Because preferences are basically expressed within the society, not just because of what the individuals want, but beyond that, that our creation of goods and services, our creation of housing should take cognizance of the holistic understanding of the society that we have not just on the individuals alone. So households do not just make decisions in a vacuum. And uh, the other criticism of this particular uh, methodological occupancy or individualism is the issue of optimization is not practicable. Optimization is not practicable because you have to look at that cognitive ability. Some of these individuals, they don't have the cognitive ability to be able to make decisions for themselves. That is why participation is good. It's good to really include the urban poor in participation because most of the time we think that we, they don't know what they want, but we need to really get to understand them. So the criticism is based on the fact that optimization process itself is costly. Knowledge is very expensive. I know at the moment with the advent of internet and all that, but even data is still expensive. Not everybody is able to assess it. And uh, this particular cognitive ability becomes an issue generally. And that's why I want to talk briefly on the right to adequate housing, the urban poor, before I round up tonight. Uh, one of the things that we need to look at is that there's a strong need at the moment, there's a strong need at the moment for heading urban areas, for heading urban housing delivery. And that's why the current SDGs or the Sustainable Development uh, Goals and the new urban agenda really get to speak about how developmental should be inclusive, how it should basically evolve. Previously, before the SDGs, we have the MDGs, the Million Development Goals. 
which had a policy to say that we need to ensure that the life of 100 million urban dwellers are uplifted. 100 million compared in, in, the, in the space of 1 billion is not, is, is more or less like it's not within a tip of an iceberg. So, with the reconfiguration of the sustainable development goals, target 11, uh, section 1 says that by 2030, we should ensure access generally. We should ensure access to adequate uh, uh, and safe, uh, affordable housing. My concern when I look at these particular agendas is that I prefer the new urban agenda because the new urban agenda says that no one should be left behind. And we should ensure that sustainable urban development is done for a social inclusive reason, never ending poverty. We should ensure that what we do is not just within a certain number. It's not just within a certain number of years that it must happen within 2030 and all that. Sustainable development for social inclusion and ending poverty. That's what we should be looking at. And with the particular S uh, SDG target 11 comes the other SDGs of no poverty, gender, equality and all that, climate actions, reducing equality, and much more the aspect of peace and strong institutions, which you cannot take away if you really want to deliver for the urban poor, if you want to really cater for the needs of the urban poor. And with the new urban agenda, we have the aspect of providing a guiding principle for holistic policies and strategies that will actually ensure that national government, local government actually are able to respond to the new reality that we have in our hands. And also the new urban agenda says that we need to actually achieve this transformation on the ground by placing the urban poor and human rights at the forefront. Because we can't talk about housing delivery without talking about the issues of human rights uh, and, the, and the urban poor. So with the new urban agenda, it's all about providing homes for the urban poor. Nobody should be left behind. About building sustainable and inclusive communities and cities. I'm really going to talk about this inclusivity later. And a multiplier for socioeconomic development. Because if we look at the numbers, we look at 1 billion people, urban poor. Imagine if they contribute just 20 or 30 percent to the space that we're actually living in, there's going to be a multiplier for socioeconomic development. This is going to be enormous. The, the, the sustainability, the economic sustainability of the city is really going to be assured. That's basically what we see in China at the moment, where the urban poor are really uplifted and they're able to contribute and all that. And with this particular right to adequate housing is the understanding of the rights in terms of the understanding of the human rights. And with the understanding of the human rights comes three aspects, the right to freedom, right to entitlement, and much more housing should entail protection. There should be no unlawful eviction. And with this particular right comes the other aspect of security of tenure, coming about, talk about protection against forced eviction and much more participation in housing. Because most times we think that the urban poor should not participate. They don't know what they want. You know, we basically assume a, a top-down approach without looking at the bottom-up approach because we design for them and at the end of the day, there's basically no uh, opportunity for them to actually assess this space. We have a lot of housings within the city that after five Five years of construction, nobody lives there. Because w when they were doing it, people were not consulted. I think a classical example of this particular aspect in terms of participation is what you see with the ethos today, which is basically you know, what I'm talking about. And with the issue of uh, equity and, and, and inclusion for the urban poor should be the aspect of slum upgrading, slum upgrading and adequate and affordable housing. We should look at that carefully. And much more, we should be thinking about reduction of inequality. Through legal, uh, we provide uh, a legal framework that enables, let me say, a balanced playground for everybody to, be, to, to enable them to have access to opportunity. And much more, talking about the city prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, no city can actually claim to be prosperous when a large segment of the population are actually living in abject poverty. There is no s s progress, there is no success in a particular city, there is no prosperity. And some of the impact of housing the Umba poor is like things relating to economic growth, which is really dear to us, improve public health. We have the improved safety and security, which every one of us really desire. Everybody wants to live in a space that is really uh, secure. Most of the time in Johannesburg, people don't actually buy homes these days. What you actually buy is security because you really check where you want to stay. So you're actually paying for security as against buying a home. So imagine when we are able to house the urban poor, we improve safety and security. Everybody can live anywhere, and much more there's access to opportunity for everybody. Then we're able to reduce disaster risk and all that. 
I think it was last month, there was a fire that broke out in one of the informal settlements. A lot of disasters happening and all that. Lots of human life that should have contributed to the society that we live in. And in terms of adequate housing, adequate housing needs to meet this particular following criteria. They should meet the criteria of cultural adequacy, which is lacking today in our development. Because everything seems to be so new colonial, uh, colonial thinking that we take out the cultural adequacy. Most of the housing that we build today, in those days, we used to have courtyards. Basically, where people come around in the evening to actually have dialogues and children are taught about a whole lot of things. At the moment, we don't have, there's no cultural adequacy in our housing uh, creation at the moment in the, in the designs. It's like architects have moved away from that. Then the aspect of affordability is not there, much more location. In aspect of the location, because the housing for the urban poor should not be located in some remote areas within the city where they're not able to assess any opportunities. Because when you take them out of this particular space, what happens is that you dislocate their, their networks. Coming into the city to basically assess the opportunity becomes too expensive for them. That's why adequate housing needs to be in this particular aspect if we really want to do anything right. And lastly, colleagues, as a roundup, is the fact that we need to look at enabling policy environment. With, an, with the policy environment I'm talking about, we need to seek a policy environment which is updated. Most of the policies that we have today in our African countries, they are outdated. They are not able to speak to the needs of the present reality. So we are still trying to fit what we had in 1950, in 1960, when the colonial masters were still here, we're trying to fit it into the new reality. That is not going to work. We need policies that are updated, and we need policies that we adapt to slum context. Because I know some of us that live in a uh, highbrow area, some of you live in something, you don't want any informal housing around you. That's why one of the policies in South Africa that was so really inclusive, that talks about uh, like the policy that was used in the development of Cosmo City, the in uh, integrated housing policy, where you have various models of housing within a particular space is the way to go. Because there is no way you live in some highbrow area with this particular uh, uh, people around you, there's going to be a lot of insecurity. So we need policy that we adapt to slum context and much more that will be holistic and integrated in all aspects. And one of the things I'm really trying to portray, I'm trying to really push tonight, is the aspect that we should seek for urban policies that promote positive mindset towards the urban dwellers. Because most of the policies really create a whole lot of sinister motives within the whole context to say that these urban dwellers, and, 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 and they are not good for, for, for us to have here. We must take them somewhere else. We need to have policies that promote positive, positive mindset that is basically pro-poor. Policies that are pro-poor that will actually enable them to be integrated very well in the city. And with this policy comes the aspect of the vision, changing mindset, enabling environments, much more having an institutional setting that will support everything that we need in terms of adequately housing the urban poor. As a roundup, some of the take home I want to really share with us tonight is that urbanization due to migration is a reality. It's a reality and uh, this is leading to increased growth of slum which basically we see every now and then. And this particular slum, they lack infrastructure and basic and amenities, as you all know. And then they are basically at a very high risk of uh, contacting both uh, communicable and non-communicable disease, which can actually uh, stress our health facilities and all that. And the other take home is challenges exist in terms of the administrative issues, policy issues, and much more involvement of non-governmental service providers because we want government to do everything at the moment. The question is, the NGOs we have, the, the civil societies, what are their responsibilities in terms of really advocating for the rights of the urban poor? I see urbanization as a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it provides opportunities, and on the other hand, there's the aspect of the economic development. Urbanization is not evil. The urban poor is not evil. Once we're able to integrate them, it becomes a win-win situation. And also, unplanned, uh, uh, unplanned urban growth is associated with a whole lot of issues like the environmental degradation, sanitation, and a whole lot of other issues. What I believe is that if urbaniza when urbanization is done right, it can actually boost the living standards in Africa. We have an opportunity in Africa with our, with our numbers to actually boost the living standard of Africans by themselves. So colleagues, looking into the future, what I'm currently thinking, the urban poor is very dear to me. 
Uh, one of the things I'm currently looking at now is the aspect of the urban cities of the future, which is basically what we call the smart new cities. Because we cannot just talk about the policy, the energy environment, we should be thinking about something altogether different. The cities that we have today, if they're not able to take, uh, if they're not able to cater for the needs of the urban poor, we should be looking for smart new cities of the future that will be detached from what we currently have now that should exist by itself. Sustainable smart new cities. That is the reality. And that is the only way we can actually be able to respond to the needs of urbanization. Also, one of the things I'm currently looking at is the issue of biomimicry in the built environment. Biomimicry is basically falling back to the principles of nature. Nature has existed for more than 3.5 billion years. Nature is the best teacher. And with that, we're looking at how to bring in the principles of biology into uh, construction activities to see how we can actually resolve it effectively. Because you must ask yourself, how does nature control erosion? There is never erosion in the wild. When the monkeys are making noise in the wild, the, the other animals don't have hearing problems. They don't wear hearing aids. So we can actually solve issues of noise pollution through how things are happening in the wild. That's where we're also looking at biomimicry. We're also looking at biomimicry in blockchain. It's one of the things that one of the research we're working on in our research group at the moment. Also, we're looking at blockchain and smart contracts in the construction industry. And also, we're looking at the aspect of renewable building materials, which will actually be able to, that will help us to really respond to the needs of the urban poor. This, but this, actually a how, this is actually a housing uh, estate in Maputo, which is actually built, built based on re renewable materials, purely alternative building materials. Everything here, they were all assembled. The way assembled is actually a live building in Maputo. This also is existing uh, somewhere in China. And also, we're also looking at industrialized building system and uh, construction 4.0, looking at aspect of digitalization. How do we digitalize construction processes? Because construction is very backward. We we, our fathers were building with bricks 700 years ago. We are still building with bricks. So we, we are actually looking at how do we bring in digitalization expertise to this particular space. So in the last few years, between 2000 and 2017, looking at some of the things that have obsessed us, uh, we have been able to do five books between this particular space. And currently, looking to the future, um, with uh, my other colleagues, we are currently working on three books for 2020. And one of them relates to housing and environmental impacts. We're looking at combustion. When you're cooking in your house, when you're doing a whole lot of things, the aspect of combustion, how does it affect the occupants that live in this particular space? Then we're also having a book on settlement patterns. You know, on the settlement patterns, we're trying to look at the, the issue of cemeteries. You have areas where you have cemeteries. How does those cemeteries affect the housing prices in those particular areas? Okay? Because I know people live within the cemeteries, those particular areas, but if a house is for sale within a cemetery area, will you buy? Okay, and also we also look. We are also looking at the aspect of construction and communication. We 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 we've gone far with the books to be published in 2020. So one of our session is everybody said that this is impossible. Then someone came along who who was not aware of what they said, and he or she did it. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to be inspired. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Um, program director, it seems today that the program director is virtual. So we'll have to contend with imagining who the program director is. Program director, please allow me to greet and acknowledge the guests gathered here tonight for this auspicious occasion. Professor Clinton Agbavboa, his Excellency, the Ambassador Kabir Bala, Nigeria's High Commission to South Africa, and His Excellency, the Council General of Nigeria to South Africa, Mr. Adama, Professor Patrick O'Brien, acting on, the, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Daniel Mashau, Executive Dean at the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment, esteemed academicians from the University of Johannesburg and other universities, 
Professor Ike Balboa's colleagues in his own faculty, family members as led by the mother, friends and fellow South Africans. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to be the respondent to the inauguration of a fellow African scholar to the esteemed position of professor. Professor Agbavboa, tonight you will be conferred into the elite body of select scholars who have proved themselves worthy of this high title of professorship, a title which many scholars the world throughout aspire to hold, including yours truly. I therefore have the honor to congratulate you for this major achievement. Congratulations, Professor. Your academic biography clearly spells out the journey that you have traveled to reach this level of academic success. Thank you for requesting me to speak at your inauguration. In your inauguration address, you raised the important issue of the resolution of the crises that face the urban poor, especially their housing challenges. The title of your paper is Thought Provocative. Beyond the classics of methodological occupancy, a case for the urban poor is a plea for a paradigm shift in the manner in which human settlement, especially for the urban poor, is viewed, planned, and executed. This critique resonates very well with my own scholarship. As you are aware, I'm pursuing research and intellectual inquiry in the area of spatial transformation, with specific focus on the idea of creation of sustainable new smart cities as one of the ways of reversing apartheid spatial legacies and advancing economic transformation and growth in our country. My book, New Cities, New Economies, South Africa and Africa's Grand Plan, a Pan-African Economic Revolution, will be published in a few weeks' time. In this book, I concur with your intellectual concerns about the quagmire of policy frameworks that guide housing for the urban poor from the context of spatial justice. Human settlement is an integral part of how a nation configures its sovereign space. In South Africa, the injustices that are faced by the urban poor find their genesis from apartheid spatial planning legacies. They are furthermore compounded by the glacial, glacially incremental policies of the democratic state, some of which have tended to perpetuate rather than obliterate apartheid legacies. It is my conviction that, given the fact that the engineering of the apartheid society was highly geographic, any serious attempt at building a new society has to examine spatial distortions in South Africa. Spatial settlement can anchor a very stubborn, concrete phenomenon, incorrigible, hard to transform, let alone reform. Hence, our consideration of the housing challenges for the urban poor in South Africa in particular has to be approached from the context of the struggle for the pursuit of spatial justice, which has implications for many other human rights in any given society. Space matters. Where people settle and how they settle there, which has implications for their housing needs, frames social relations. As Masi argued, social relations have an impact on power dynamics in society. The relational dynamics to space elucidates the geography of power relations. Which actors or classes tend to gain the most or become constrained by spatial structuring is at the heart of the relational conceptualization of space. Hence, you are correct to argue, Professor Agbavboa, that neoclassical perspectives to housing policies, especially in the context of South Africa, may fail to deal with the obvious racial and class contradictions that emanate from years of embedding segregated <coughs> spatial form through apartheid spatial imposition into South African society. As Soja proffered in his critique of space, the spatiality of justice is an integral and formative component of justice itself, a, a vital part of how justice and injustice are socially constructed and evolve over time. How space is actively involved in generating and sustaining inequality, injustice, economic exploitation, racism, sexism, 
and other forms of oppression and discrimination informs the crux of the struggle for spatial justice. Housing policies in South Africa have tended to reform apartheid <coughs> spatial planning, spatial planning legacies, rather than totally transform them. Interventions for housing the urban poor have resulted in further racial and class segregation, as many townships at the fringes of cities have sprung up in similar manner to how apartheid located black people in blacks only areas far away from economic activities. There is a failure by the democratic state, which currently holds enormous political power, to alter apartheid legacies by defining new human settlements that address the housing needs of the poor, while at the same time heralding new economic nodes, industrial nodes that can shape new urban settlements ex nihilo, that is, in totally new spaces. Critical social theory can assist to boost your arguments for a shift in the manner in which we determine social, I'm sorry, in the manner in which we determine housing needs for the urban poor, Professor Babwa. The premise of engagement in critical theory is that the social world is a world that can possibly be changed. It is not static and thus is subject to various influences. Critical theory essentially claims that all the boundaries of the social world are constructed. It is concerned with power and justice how injustice, oppression, and oppression shape people's realities, which can be argued to be the case in terms of the historic and current legacies of apartheid human settlement, housing demarcations, and forms in South Africa. As stated in your paper, Professor Agbabwa, 6.5 billion people are projected to live in urban areas in, by 2050. Majority of this growth in rapid urbanization will happen in the developing regions of the world, especially in Asia and Africa. However, it does not seem that African states, South Africa included, are adequately planning for such projected massive urbanization. Hence, my scholarship is advancing the need for the consideration of the creation of multiple thousands of new cities in Africa in the next coming decades in order to contend with the obvious human migration challenge that has already been foreseen. But more importantly, to define new settlements and economic opportunities that rival colonial legacies, which are heavily stagnating progress in our continent. Housing policies have to be scrutinized broadly in terms of how they contribute to this framework of shaping a future of our choice, a future so different from what was bequeathed by colonialism. As I have argued in my book, failure to do this will feed and fuel neo-apartheid, which is already rampant in many aspects of our current society. My proposition is that housing policies in South Africa have to be approached from the context of a vision of total spatial reconstruction in South Africa, which I have suggested as being the creation of sustainable new cities that will herald new economic nodes across the entire country. The new cities, new economies vision is a proposition that defines the next epoch of development in South Africa and Africa, and it is anchored on four fundamental principles. Number one, national spatial reconstruction, which promotes the creation of an entirely new society with a reconfigured space economy. Number two, economic revolution. This is urgently necessary in order to boost our country's badly performing economy through massive construction of economic infrastructure, creation of new industrial nodes, and modernization of society. Number three, Pan-African economic development. This is important in order for South Africa, in, because in order for South Africa's economy to grow exponentially, it is pivotal that it becomes deliberately intertwined with Africa's development. Number four, empowerment. It is critically important that the New Cities, New Economies Development Plan concurrently attains the empowerment of the previously and currently economically disenfranchised majority of our, of our population. Only this way can there be all round sustainable prosperity and reconciliation for all. The morphology of our urban human settlement, which also accounts for how the urban poor are housed in our cities, can either continue to be a slow experiment of wrestling with reforms of apartheid legacies, or it can readily be altered deliberately by shaping new egalitarian spaces that give people the ability to exercise their full potential in a free nation of their dreams. 
I hope that these words have contributed to the discourse of your scholarship, which your promotion to the elite club of professors, Professor Agbavba, will help to continue shaping for the sake of our country and continent's prosperous future. Congratulations once more. Thank you. As we reach the end of the ceremony, allow me again, Professor Abavara, to congratulate you on having achieved tonight a momentous milestone in your academic career, your professorial inaugural lecture. Your lecture demonstrated your exceptional ability to profess your knowledge, giving new meaning to a theme that has occupied human endeavors from time immemorial namely to find and provide shelter and housing for humankind. But, of course, your lecture this evening highlighted the fact that as we face the fourth industrial revolution, it is a global challenge for the urban poor. And to address this challenge, we require the academic insights and contributions of people like yourself. Your promotion to professor confirms the high level of scholarship you have already achieved. I look, I look forward to observing the leadership associated with this position in Senate and elsewhere. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your journey. The night is warm and life is too short to sweat on your own. So I thus invite you all to join us for refreshments which will be served at, in the venue to the left as you leave the council chambers. And thank you very much for attending.